Thank you very much. And uh, now we will turn to our speakers for uh, any comments. There were a number of questions raised here. So I hope that uh, you all um, took some notes. Uh, I think we will begin with Trisha. Trisha, are you here with us? Yes. yes. Um, I just want to, uh, okay, I'll address the answers and then say my thanks. Um, there was a question raised about migration. So uh, as uh, some of you may be aware, um, India suffered from the largest migration crisis during COVID. Um, on March 24th, our uh, Honorable Prime Minister got up and gave everyone a four hour uh, heads up to effectively say that uh, lockdown is going to be imposed, the worst kind of lockdown, with all sort of public transportation being uh, you know, shut down, which caused uh, migrants to walk back home. Some walked for thousands of miles. Uh, we had horrifying pictures, a lot of people died. Um, so again, it just shows to you know, highlight uh, failed leadership. And critically, um, the lack of access to dignity not just human rights, but not treating people with dignity. We had contrasting images where uh, repatriation flights were happening, where we were flying back as citizens from foreign countries, um, and they were being sent to fancy hotels for uh, to self quarantine. And in contrast, some of the migrants were being doused with chemicals used to clean cars um, after having walked for hours. So um, this virus has again highlighted. Um, you know, how much value do we give to each life uh, and how much are we treating people with uh, dignity? Um, when it comes to this, uh, you know, the, the question about uh, Kashmir, um, I hear you. Uh, there was another question raised about uh, what are the human rights violence crisis going on? This, um, the way we are treating our Muslim community and minority community in India is critical. Also, I think, you know, we need to discuss when we talk about women's issues, it's gender non-conforming people and the transgender community as well. That has faced a lot of pushback uh, uh, and attacks on their human rights. Uh, when it comes to Kashmir, as my colleague from Pakistan would know, we are bound by the Simla Accord, uh, where both countries, most so specifically India, refuses to allow any sort of foreign intervention, even the UN, uh, in matters of Kashmir. So uh, not to say we should not be highlighting human rights atrocities happening there. We have to. And this is where, as a global community, as you all, a cohort of people that have come together, bound by values, play such a critical role in constantly highlighting the grave inequalities we are facing. You know, I often say we shouldn't just talk about the North Star. This is what we should be doing. I think it's very important to highlight the inequalities, highlight the human rights abuses. That's why I said, you know, pin the tail of the donkey, because when you spell it and call it out and highlight failed leadership, especially on a global level, is when we can hope uh, to see some sort of change happening on ground. Uh, and finally, what I will say is, you know, the conversation about uh, reservation. Look, I very much echo what Gabriela said. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Her Excellency Maria as well, where we're talking about, we need reservation. We cannot talk about meritocracy when we have seen the old leadership. If you look at the old leadership, come on, are we really talking about meritocracy when we see the kind of leadership on display that we have? <laughs> so the only way uh, we will get to the desired results where these conversations have actual change beyond sanitized walls is if we push for quotas quotas for women, quotas for young women within that further demarginalization of young women, of gender non-conforming people, of people from the most marginalized communities. And this is where I think historically, uh, you know, the African women have shown exemplary leadership, transgender community has shown exemplary leadership um, because they understand that without forced quotas, uh, their issues will not be heard. Uh, and this is why we should reject all arguments of meritocracy because meritocracy has failed our gender. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and finally, what I will just say is thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Madam Fumzile. Thank you, all of you. Uh, because in my country where I am currently, it feels sad. We feel like we're leaving too many people behind. And I often wonder what is the impact of these conversations going to have on very real lives, you know, that I engage with. Uh, and when I hear the kind of formidable commitments being made, when I hear Maria stressing on feminist uh, 
policy, when I hear Gabriella calling it as it is, demanding for representation of youth leadership, when I see Kristen, you leading parliamentarians bound together by global goals, um, I sense urgency urgency and no more saying of placating to excuse my language of which is unparliamentary no more placating to bullshit uh, so thank you uh, and uh, thank you for inspiring me through your words and your history of advocacy and work i'm so grateful to be here amongst you all speakers Trisha, we thank you for your leadership and for being a you know, tireless activist and you know, speaking, as you said, on a global level about the issues that you are facing. This is what we need to do and to help each other to um, you know, give that voice a platform. So thank you so much uh, for being with us. And I would like to hear if um, Silvana, would you like to give just a brief um, closing remark as well? Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for this highly interesting contributions from around the world and getting to uh, getting um, more insights into what's happening and the political action taken. I just I want to flag uh, one crucial element that is testing and WPL has just uh, last week participated with the health coalition of the G20 on uh, a seminar which was uh, focusing on women leaders as championing the issue of testing as, as one means to fight the pandemic that we have already at hand. And when I hear, for example, from UAE and others, how crucial the tests have been uh, being a part of the success in fighting the virus, I, I would believe it is sort of a double imperative to make sure that women leaders once more are connected with that, um, because women as health politicians, as crisis managers, have also the, 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 the history, the legacy and the um, credibility of, of leaders that look at preventing a peak of a crisis. So make sure that things are under control before we come to just managing the terrible outcomes. And that's something that women have been credited, rightly so, with for many, many years and um, is crucial once more in a situation like we have here now. So um, maybe let me conclude by saying, by echoing everything that has been said about the need of having more women as parliamentarians, as, as political leaders, in order to bring the different perspectives, the representation of people, and also the, the solutions to unusual situations to the decision-making table. And uh, I would hope that webinars like this help by raising awareness for this need. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much, Silvana, and thank you for being with us today. Um, I would now like to give the floor to Maria for closing remarks, please. Yes, it's... Uh... This conversation has been so, so energizing. We need a lot of that in these uh, times of, of hardship uh, and very taxing times, especially being uh, in New York since the beginning and having recovered uh, from COVID, which was also a very difficult uh, experience. And I would, uh, you know, there were questions about quotas, meritocracy and all of that. And, and I think that we do have the responsibility to keep repeating the arithmetic of inequality. It is very important. And it is just not, not only about numbers, as I said before. It's not to even up the, you know, even up the, the numbers. It is about the quality of our political systems. It is about the quality of our democracies. It is about the quality of the decisions we take it is about, uh, you know, true politics serving the people. And um, when we are thinking about uh, uh, COVID recovery plan, short term and long term, uh, women and girls have to be front and center. And, uh, you know, let, let's just speak two examples very quickly. We have heard excellent uh, case, case studies from different countries around the world, which was very encouraging. But, you know, let's look at uh, women and girls with disabilities. One in five women globally um, face amplified intersectional forms of discrimination and inequality. And that include uh, women uh, with disability. If you pick gender-based violence, you, you were giving numbers that are 
staggering. You know, um, the recovery package and new regulatory frameworks, they have put, they have to put women and girls at the center. Silvana was mentioning the issue of testing, but it is the issue of access to treatment to treatment, to be prepared for the vaccine when it comes, it has to be of universal access. It has to be free for all. Um, you, there's so many happening around the world, but we have to make sure that the 132 million people that are in need of humanitarian protection uh, receive what they, what they need to receive. 132 million 38 million women, young women and girls require life-saving sexual and reproductive health services and interventions. So we, we have to continue, you know, putting the numbers forward. And, and I believe uh, that, um, you know, the quota system shouldn't be necessary, but it is, unfortunately it is. And in my experience as former Minister of Defense, the first thing I did is to pass an affirmative action policy for women in the military. Uh, when I was foreign minister, I passed a policy for women equality and gender parity in the diplomatic service. Uh, and that has to do also with numbers, but also with quality. You know, again, numbers, you know, equate quality. It is not about just uh, having the, 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 the right numbers. It is about fighting inequalities, it is about having a feminist recovery agenda, a feminist building back better agenda that we have to build together. And I insist, parliaments and parliamentarians have a key role to play in their uh, budgetary allocations, but in also in, in lawmaking, in re regulatory efforts that uh, they, they are um, mandated uh, to, to deliver. So, Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful conversation and opportunity. And uh, I'm an optimist, and I think that we need to fight unilateralism with more multilateralism. We have to fight uh, selfishness with more and, and, and better generosity and, and cooperation. And, and I think that that's part of the reason why we are uh, here today. Thank you again to IPU, uh, the IPU president, uh, Jeffrey Sachs and the uh, um, SDSN, um, uh, incredible work, and uh, to all of you uh, for today. Thank you very much, Marianne. Thank you for being with us. Uh, and finally, uh, Gabriela, for your closing remarks, please. Uh, yeah, so I'm sorry, I had Pumzile and Jeff I had to excuse themselves for other meetings, so they will not be sharing uh, closing remarks, but we're pleased to have Gabriela, please. Thank you, thank you very much, Kirsten. And again, thank you very much, dear colleagues, for this wonderful exercise of understanding that the gender agenda, the feminist movement, also needs team working, needs synergies, needs to work together and with solidarity. Sometimes we forget that the real power of multilateralism is understanding that a multiplicity of voices, having dialogue in the same table is precisely the best option for reaching peace, development, inclusion. And that happens also with the gender agenda. That happens with, with the women's fight. If we are not working together coordinated with a good strategy, nothing is going to change or we are going to be very, very slow. Uh, Fomsile is not here anymore. She, she had to, to run to another meeting as Kirsten said, but every time that I work with Fomsile and we meet and yes, we understand how important it is, for example, all these wonderful exercises that IPU is doing in terms of building a database. We are monitoring every single country in terms, for example, on the number of women in parliaments, the number of women in cabinets, that's head of states. But if we see that in 1995, there were only 11% of women in parliaments, of seats in parliaments, and now it's 24.5%, yes, it has doubled. But in 25 years, that is not the rate we need. So that's why we need to work together. We need to understand that solidarity is key to advance in the gender agenda. 
I would like also to mention, some of you were saying about uh, conflict zones and what's happening in certain areas of the planet. Yes, IPU works in this regard. We have a committee for the promotion of the international humanitarian law. So uh, you can reach the, the president of this committee. is also a wonderful woman, Agnes Badai. So if you want to, to talk with her, I can, I can ask her to, to contact you. So please send me an email or, or in the chat or however you prefer. But we have this committee. We also have a bureau of women parliamentarians who are very actively working on which are the best practices within a parliament, but also in our communities to change the reality. Allow me to say something very, very, very fast uh, because I know that we are running out of time. We need to understand that the only way to change women's reality is bringing women on board in terms of decision-making processes in terms of building some kind of infrastructure, some kind of habitat for women. We cannot expect women to be, as Marta Taglia was saying, uh, heading 30% of the, of the homes, for example, in our country, Mexico, and ask them to have money to feed their kids, to go to school, to have a job, to, uh, to take care of their parents. We need to uh, be prepared in terms of legislation, in terms of budget, in terms of policies, and create an environment that be able to, to allow us to be free to fulfill also our dreams in terms of community commitment. The only way that we are going to be, to have our wings and dreams and opportunities is if parliaments and parliamentarians are doing their job, their responsibility. So please, dear colleagues, help us in building a more inclusive, a feminist, a sustainable planet. And thank you, thank you very much to our wonderful colleagues, uh, panelists, guests. Thank you very much for staying with us. Thank you very much for joining and sharing this effort with the UN Sustainable uh, Solutions. Thank you very much for joining also with uh, Kirsten and her new organization, Parliamentarians for the Global Goals, with the Interparliamentary Union, the oldest, uh, a political multilateral organization. We all want to change this planet. Thank you also very much, Silvana, who has been very active creating also awareness in social media. Maria Fernanda, thank you for leading by example. Thank you very much to all. Thank you, Gabriela. Wonderful uh, conclusion. So I won't add uh, much to that. Just remind everyone that we have uh, two more webinars coming up. So the next one will be August 4th and the final one so far will be September 3rd, same time of day as this one. So 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. So make sure to mark that in your calendars and we will get back with uh, more information on that uh, by email to everyone who signed up to uh, this webinar. So make sure to uh, keep an eye out for that. And please, if you can, send your remarks. There's a link to a survey in the chat that we would very much like everyone to fill out. If you have comments, remarks, or requests for future uh, topics you would like us to cover or like to discuss with your colleagues, um, don't hesitate to do that. And um, also, just a reminder, this is Chatham House Rules, so you're welcome to share uh, some of your own uh, takeaways from this, but uh, please don't quote uh, others from this um, session. And once again, thank you for uh, our distinguished speakers and experts for joining us. Thank you so much for the co-organizers, uh, Gabriella and IPU, Jeffrey Sachs and SDSN. Thank you so much. And last but not least, thank you for all the um, parliamentarians that joined us from all over the world. This is your forum, and we hope that you all uh, had some takeaways from today that you will be able to go home, discuss with your colleagues, and hopefully also implement in your parliamentary work. This is what uh, we hope to achieve with these uh, webinars and with this uh, group that we're, we're establishing now. If you want to learn more about parliamentarians for the Global Goals, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. i would be happy to discuss it with any of you. So uh, thank you for joining us today and we'll see you again for the next webinar, August 4th. Take care. <laughs>